Recording in progress. Well, this program is a collaboration between Institute in Jakarta at the Faculty of Social and Social Science, uh, Universitas Islam International Indonesia. And on behalf of the faculty, I would like to thank the Faculty of Social Science, Universitas Islam Indonesia, or my husband, <laughs> for this journey. <laughs> I would also like to thank Fulbright Indonesia, which has made it possible for us to invite Professor Ben Slater to have talk at UIN in Jakarta today. And I also would like to thank all audience, both offline and all, all online, at Zoom meeting for your participation in this program. Okay, now let's begin our program today by reciting Basmal together. Bismillah. First, I would like to give the opportunity to the Dean of the Faculty of Social and Political Science to give a very short welcoming remark. Professor Duryodhan Saiba, time is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome uh, to our academic talk for everybody and especially for personal Darwin Charter. Welcome to our faculty. Visit to in Jakarta. You know, uh, visit faculty of uh, social and political science. And I'm very honored uh, for your visit. Yeah, because yeah, it's very amazing that you can come to visit to this uh, faculty. <clears throat> and yeah, uh, we admire you. I I know from. The Google Scholar, you have 6,057 uh, 6, citations. <laughs> That's why uh, we admire you. <laughs> like, you know, you have a very great job, and I know uh, some of us also have yeah, little bit of similar to you. Paburhan have 2,186 2, citations. <laughs> you, but I think uh, your visit will inspire us to have uh, as uh, the great job as you. Some of us, are, some of us, I think, uh, hopefully, and we cannot uh, we cannot wait for uh, for uh, we cannot wait to listen to your presentation on uh, authoritarian authoritarianism in historical perspective and uh, ladies and gentlemen let's uh, enjoy this uh, academic talk thank you very much and last but not least would like to thank to William Aydin for organizing this seminar and also Basiro already sponsored this seminar also full right <laughs> thank you very much assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh <laughs> Thank you, uh, Bu Zuriatun Koyiba. Okay, now let's move on to uh, the main agenda of this program. As you already know, we already have a speaker here, and Bu Iba already shortly introduced Professor Dan Slater. He has a very long CV. I have to read all of your CV. You want enough for a day? So I will only highlight the short bio of your CV. So, uh, Professor Dan Slater, currently uh, James Orrin Murphy Professor, political and the director of Mesa Center for Emerging Democracies, University of Michigan, USA. 
this research focuses on the issues of uh, state building, authoritarianism, mm -hmm. and democracies in various countries, specifically in Southeast Asia and also in broader contexts like Latin America, I said, right? And he's already published many article journals, books, and recently he's also just published uh, a new book by uh, Princeton University Press entitled From Development and Democracy, The Transformation of Modern Asia. I hope some of you here already have the book. Anyone? If you don't have it, I recommend to add his book in your book collection. <laughs> Grab <it> soon. <laughs> Promotion. <laughs> Okay, uh, I think without any further ado, I would like to give the opportunity to Professor Dan's lecture to begin your presentation. Terima kasih, Julian, Pak Siro, semua semuanya. Terima kasih atas undangan ini. I'm very, very happy to be here. Um, and I'll be presenting. So William said, "Don't uh, don't do same presentation as at Ubi Tika. Do something different." It's a, it's a very very demanding boss. <laughs> new material, new, new, new material, something new. So uh, this is uh, this is something new, uh, and maybe maybe uh, maybe too new. So I have been uh, asked what this what this paper is. Um, will be will be one chapter in a new Oxford handbook. To be an Oxford Handbook of Authoritarian Regimes. Um, and this will be, if everyone accepted invitations, it will be uh, 62 chapters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so I, I was asked if I wanted to write on any topic, and there were 62 topics. And the one that caught my eye was uh, authoritarianism and historical perspective. And I thought, well, this will be, this will be very interesting. Um, and then try to come up with, again, in the context of 61 other essays about authoritarianism, what can I say that's distinctive to add some value to the discussion about uh, a historical perspective? Because I always try to approach political science from a historical perspective. Um, and I'd like to kind of make the case um, today that when we study authoritarianism, and now, especially in political science, it's so much more common. It's become much, much more common to study authoritarianism. But a lot of it does not take a historical perspective. So I want to say a little bit about my thoughts, my evolving thoughts um, on what it means to study authoritarianism in a historical way. Uh, be more specific about the different ways in which history might, might matter and be very important for how we think about authoritarian regimes. Um, and, and hopefully pro so provide some, some kinds of guidance and some thoughts on uh, what, what the literature has, has, has taught us so far. So um, this might be a little bit more like, almost more like a class session in a way than the product of research. The, uh, the, the paper, so I decided to present this paper because I had a due date. I have to break this paper um, very, very, very soon. And so this, this very useful way forced me to start writing the paper. And I've got the first uh, about, well, first third of it is is written, um, so it's still very very much new work in progress. I hope it won't be too uh, too uh, unhooked for uh, for our purpose. I hope it will be give us a lot to, to to think about and talk about. So I don't know if I make a noise when I want this like ding. Um, okay, so we need it. it. <laughs> we need it. Um, so in, in the introductory session, what I what I argue is that um, authoritarianism is imbued with history it's suffused with history the, the the very the very phenomenon itself is entangled with history so studying it from a non-historical perspective means you miss something very very important um, and so i argue that authoritarianism is entangled with history in, in three different ways so, and these are I mean, different ways in which every authoritarian regime in the world has to be thought of in terms of this triple historical entanglement. First, it exists in world historical time. So the fact that the authoritarian regime exists at a particular moment on the, on the calendar, in a particular era, is, is vital to understanding how that regime will work. That the authoritarian has been a very different phenomenon across different eras in world historical time. So that's one historical entanglement. The second is that Authoritarian regimes all exist 
and emerge through some kind of historical sequence. So they arise either before or after certain very important other phenomena like economic development or, uh, or war or conflict or the building of the state, right? You know, lots of different establishment of the rule of law, right? There are other enormously important aspects of history that an authoritarian regime exists in a historical sequence for. So that's different from, is it 1940, is it, 19, is it 1830? It's a different historical aspect, right? So the historical sequence. And the third historical entanglement that all authoritarian regimes have is, the, is their historical origins, okay? And so if we want to understand how an authoritarian regime operates, we have to understand how it originated, okay? And that the, the, the way in which an authoritarian regime is born, the way that it comes about, has lasting implications for how it operates and whether it's likely to be durable, whether it's likely to cater to certain groups, how it's likely to, to govern. Okay. So hopefully you can see these are so that's not anything about the sequence or the moment, what moment in history. It's about the, the ways in which, like all of us, we're all our origins shape us throughout our lives, right? So that's another historical entanglement that all authoritarian regimes have. And so I sort of suggest at the outset that any really deep understanding of authoritarian regimes, not just specific regimes, but the general phenomenon of authoritarianism requires an appreciation of this triple historical entanglement, right? So I think we can learn, we can learn a lot from theories that make very, very stylized sort of, you know, claims about you know, an authoritarian regime is an autocrat who is trying to uh, you know, balance elite relationships. Or uh, you understand an authoritarian re regime by an autocrat who needs to collect information. Or an authoritarian regime is one where an autocrat needs to establish social control over the population, right? These are, these are all very, very general, very stylized claims. And I think we can, it's not, they're not bad starting points. Or just the idea that we understand authoritarian regimes by thinking, well, an authoritarian regime you know, just wants to stay in power and everything they do is toward the goal of staying in power. So these are not incorrect things to say, but I think they, they lack appreciation of the historical entanglements of these regimes that make us actually understand not just how any particular regime works, but the, the very phenomenon itself that authoritarianism as a form of rule is a triply historically entangled phenomenon. Okay, so that's what I'll try to kind of persuade you of today. Bing. All right, so what I then do in the paper, so you might know this expression, people say, uh, I'm gonna do a, a brush clearing exercise. So what, what scholars will often do is say, I'm gonna talk about the concepts and the definition of the concept, and that will be how I clear the brush so that you can kind of you know, do the work, like as a, as a preparatory stage. Well, you know, the concepts of democracy and authoritarianism are too contested. They're too complicated to ever really clear the brush, right? So I say this is sort of a brush shuffling exercise, right? So, so what I want to do is um, think a little bit about the, you know, the, the definition and try to play with it in a way that I hope will be helpful. And so keep in mind, this, is a, this will be a book with, with 62 chapters. Right. And so it, it's not a good occasion for me to say I have an original definition of authoritarian regimes that I want to try to insist upon. Right. I, I need to work with the, the volume as a whole. But what I do want to do is relax the definition. At least as, a, as sort of a thought experiment. What if we relaxed our working definition of authoritarianism and might that help us reveal, might that reveal new things? Might it illuminate aspects of how authoritarian regimes operate? And so the way we start here is that the standard definition of authoritarianism is of, a, is of a regime and it's residual, okay? Residual in the sense that it is defined by what it is not. Authoritarian regime, authoritarianism is not democracy and it is a regime type. This is the normal way it's understood. And so uh, Ivan Ermakov uh, in the first chapter of the, of the volume, the his working definition is authoritarianism, you're referring to regimes, in which contested elections do not regulate the exercise of executive or legislative power. Okay. So this is an enormous residual category. Right? So by this residual definition, virtually every 
one in human history has lived under authoritarians, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it's so lost, it's so vast that at some point is this, there's sort of limitations to the vast understanding. And I don't think other than saying, oh, well, historically, you know, maybe regimes depend more on elections than they used to, this focus doesn't really give us insight into the way that history matters. Okay. So to, to help us understand how history matters in shaping these regimes, what, what I want to do is, is relax the definition um, in, in both ways, both by thinking of authoritarianism as a residual category and by thinking of authoritarianism as a regime. Because both of these things are not, you don't have to think of it that way. And so just for as you know, just to give an example that Sophia Fenner and I used about a decade ago, the, the definition we offered, a non-residual definition of authoritarian regimes. Authoritarian regimes are those that use state power to hinder political pluralism and opposition from flourishing. Okay. So there it's not just about what you don't do, it's about what you do do, right? This is what authoritarian regimes are actually doing. So if we pick, it's not just about not having free and fair elections. It's about the actual hindrance of opposition, right? And how has that changed over time? And another vital point, I think, is there's also, you might be aware, there's a whole literature on authoritarianism in political psychology, which doesn't see, authoritarianism is not a regime type. Authoritarianism is a personal disposition. Some people have a more authoritarian personality, they say, than others, okay? And so here, Karen Stenner, I think is kind of the, I mean, we, this goes back to Theodore Adorno, Adorno who's a, you know, an older idea, but, but Karen Stenner has a really wonderful book called The Authoritarian Dynamic, in which she defines authoritarianism, not as some kind of regime, but not as not democracy, but it's a basic predisposition favoring group authority and uniformity over individual autonomy and diversity. Okay. So if you think about it this way, and if we, again, relax our definition and allow us to think about this, we can think about historical variation here too. Um, because it seems to me that not all authoritarian regimes necessarily rest on this kind of psychological disposition, but some do and some don't. And I think it's an important source of historical variation. Okay. So um, what I think that there's sort of four things that I think relaxing this definition helps, helps reveal. And I think for arguing to just kind of to situate our minds here, we can think of the French Revolution as a, as, a, as a particularly big turning point in all of these ways, okay, between sort of modern authoritarian regimes and, and, and early modern authoritarian regimes. So one big thing that happens after the French Revolution is you get authoritarian power becomes more secularized and becomes more nationalized. So before the French Revolution, Authoritarian rule around the world was generally uh, very religious. So you have a very tight binding of, of um, political authority and religious authority. There's no real separation. Um, these are typically uh, empires or saw themselves as empires that were not limited by some kind of territorial space. So they were kind of, you, know, you, you could just kind of think of, you know, authoritarian regimes before the French Revolution basically as these universalizing, very religious empires that existed, you know, around, that existed around the world, okay? And only after the French Revolution do we both get this kind of separation of, um, of, of, of stately and secular uh, and, uh, and of religious power. Um, the containerization of that power within territorial space, okay? Um, and so you get this kind of the, the, the rise of the nation state as a unit and the state apparatus as a, as a weapon of control, as a weapon of hindrance in the hands of these authoritarian rulers. So if we think of authoritarianism as the, you know, the denial of opposition, you know, as, 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 a, as an active suppression of pluralism and opposition, you're in a different world with the rise of the modern state than you are beforehand. Just the ways in which a regime can be actively authoritarian dramatically changes and it and continues to change. So a second big change also that especially I think the French Revolution is a good turning point here is with the rise of mass politics. And not just the fact that the masses can be involved in politics, but that there is an electoral principle by which the masses have, have a right to be able to rule and, and to uh, have a say in how they're ruled. Okay. So 
before you get the rise of mass politics and before the electoral principle becomes, you know, someone you know, begins to spread, it's a very different matter to be an authoritarian ruler. You have to deal with, you know, with, with your family members. It's a very familial, right? You, 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 you build family alliances. You build, you, you try to you know, keep your dynasty secure, right? You think about your succession to, to, to which of your sons or, you know, or brother, like who should be the successor? Like these were the questions of authoritarian rule. They weren't complicated by these problems of, well, do we or do we not hold elections? Do we or do we not think about what role the masses play, right? They didn't play a role, okay? So again, I think in terms of world historical time, you know, we get this authoritarianism very differently historically entangled, okay, because of this. Um, a third difference um, is you just, you get these shifts in the technological frontier. So as technologies change, it gives, you know, either can give the state more of an advantage and authoritarian rulers more of an advantage in establishing social control, or sometimes technologies, you know, I think Michael Mann's work on this is very, very good, that, you know, sometimes technological shifts advantage society. And society gets the upper hand because the state doesn't, and authoritarian rulers don't have a strong control over, over this technology. And, and I'll make the argument, this is one very big part of the last, the last 40 years, in which I think that a series of, of, of media technologies, social media and the like, for about 20 years really advantaged opposition and really advantaged non that those who oppose authoritarian regimes. But in the last, uh, over the last decade, I think we see that um, authoritarian regimes have learned how to use um, new technologies more to their own, to their own benefit. Um, and what we're seeing is a, is a reversal. So as these technologies change, it really changes the, so it matters, right? It's not, you can't just think of an authoritarian regime as some stylized, again, an autocrat doing strategic things. It matters what kind of technologies they have at their disposal and what technologies their opponents have at their disposal, right? And this, this is a historical phenomenon. And the, and the fourth thing that I'll, that I'll stress, again, to, as a way to set the stage, is that if we go back to that question of um, authoritarian disposition, right, this idea that you, you favor hierarchy and you favor political order and you favor tradition, and you're suspicious of new, you know, of, of new practices, and you're suspicious of diversity, right? All of these things, it's political psychologists say this points you toward authoritarianism, but I think more specifically, it points you toward right-wing authoritarianism. And one thing that is certainly the case of the past century is not all authoritarian regimes are right-wing authoritarian regimes. Mm -hmm. There are also left-wing authoritarian regimes. Um, and I would argue it's not in this paper, but we could discuss it if you're interested. I think left-wing authoritarian regimes are built on a very different kind of psychological um, foundation than right-wing authoritarian regimes. Um, and I've written a bit about this, but I think the idea with left-wing authoritarian regimes is they're built through, uh, a, through a desire to um, kind of build fairness by force, if you will, to essentially to cut down the hierarchy, to, to, cut, to, to move against tradition. So very, very different kinds of, of dispositions for the left-wing and right-wing authoritarian regimes. And again, I think we only think about elections, we might not see this, or this might not jump to our minds because we're thinking, well, Stalin didn't allow elections to you know, decide who's going to be in, in, in government and neither does Putin really. So you could say, well, they're both authoritarian, but very different, really, really big historical difference in left versus right-wing. So this is the, these are the parts of the paper that I've drafted thus, thus far. And then what I'm going to do is for the rest of the time is talk about where the paper is sort of headed and basically talk about these three aspects. So each of the three historical entanglements. So world historical time, historical sequences, and historical origins. You're doing a wonderful job. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So here's kind of a first step. You, know, you might, if you, if you read this literature at all, you, you'll know that we're up into a set of historical periods in which we can expect that all those, those issues like the technological frontier and the, the importance of mass politics and those things I was just talking about where they might be at least somewhat similar within these eras, but different outside of them. So I think we kind of start with kind of this early modern era, you know, more or less from you know, the rise of the military revolution and the Renaissance, what have you, up until some would start with the French revolution. I would probably start with the American revolution just because what both the, what the American Revolution, the French Revolution, and the Haitian Revolution, all taking place in the late 18th century, all were kind of the first major blows for republicanism. 
and against the principle of monarchy in the world. And so this is, I think, the first time that the, monar the monarchical principle really comes under challenge in the world. And so again, totally changes the terrain on which authoritarianism works. The, the, the safety of monarchy can no longer be taken for, for granted, right? Um, and what this leads to then in the following 40 years, you know, one can call it the kind of the era of French challenge, this Republican era. It's when the, the Napoleonic Wars are happening, when France, having cast aside its monarchy, basically goes on, on the offensive in Europe, trying to spread the Republican principle throughout Europe. Um, and so in those 40 years, we see a very, very different kind of kind of politics, right? And so I think regimes operating then are having to reckon with the pressures of uh, republicanism on the march. And everything is sort of defined by, are you pro-French or anti-French, right? That's the defining kind of feature of this time. 1815, Napoleon is defeated. And what you get is, in Europe, is this Congress of Europe. So with Metternich as the main as the main kind of leader of this, and what you really get for these from 1815 to 1848 is this reestablishment of, uh, of, of of royalism and of, and of monarchy as the you know kind of this 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 deeply conservative anti republican pro monarchical coalition that that arises and kind of is bound together across Europe uh, during this during this period up until 1848. So I think it's a very definitive it's a very recognizable historical epoch in which regimes operate in a certain way. Okay. Um, and then for after 1848, I actually think this is the most the most interesting in some ways, but maybe the hardest to define from uh, the revolution of 1848, right, a huge number of revolutions that explode across across Europe and in other parts of the world. Um, and the period from then until World War One, which I you know, for for argument's sake, I call the era of isms, right? Um, it's hard to pin down to one thing, but this is an age when, first of all, you have now the introduction of socialism as an idea into the world. You know, the Communist Manifesto was written in 1848. So Marxism is now becoming, now is, is, is a thing. Um, it's an age of nationalism. So nationalism very, very much on the rise after 1848. And so again, regimes need to reckon with that either like Bismarck, you can try to then embrace nationalism and use that as a source of your strength or nationalism is mostly associated with democracy. And so more often what you had were these imperial authoritarian regimes that were trying to to, try to suppress nationalism, because this is also very much the age of imperialism, the age of colonialism. And so particularly in Europe, the major powers in Europe are all becoming major global imperial powers. You know, it's around the Suez Canal has opened, um, you know, European powers can, can project power into, in, across Africa, into Asia in a way they couldn't before, right? So all of, so, the, the, so one big feature of this period is the rise of these very powerful colonial authoritarian leviathans in Asia. You know, so again, ruled by so Dutch East Indies, French Vietnam, and, and et cetera, right? Um, so you have all, and then probably more than anything else, what this is, is an era of liberalism. And when liberalism and constitutionalism, because in the wake of the 1848 revolutions, the, the debates are about, well, what do we give into constitutionalism? Do we restrict monarchy, absolute monarchy to constitutional monarchy? Um, and, and in a place like Britain, Britain is sort of, you know, and some other continental powers like the Dutch and Swedes are kind of leading the way and moving toward you know, constitutionalism and, and democracy. So accordingly, we should understand the authoritarian regimes of the period as very much um, their apparatus is built to suppress these liberal gains and these constitutional gains. Okay. which is not the same thing as what they're doing in the earlier period, right? New As new ideologies arise, author, authoritarianism changes as its challengers change, as its opponents change. It's very character changing. Okay. Uh, then we then have the interwar era. Um, again, this is you know, an identifiable historical period where you get the, you know, here the, the Soviet revolution is an enormously important force. Um, and here we get extreme polarization, the rise of fascism, um, the rise of socialist movements, just an absolute explosion in mass politics during this, this period of time, much, much more intense than before. So before World War I, you could maybe hope to kind of maintain sort of a traditional dictatorship and not have to kind of engage in mass politics. That becomes much, much harder, especially in the wealthier parts of the world in the, in the interwar period. Um, and then after World War II, of course, we get then Cold War era. This should be quite familiar. Uh, the Cold War era with its dynamics of you know, bipolar world, um, lots of Soviet sponsorship, American sponsorship of authoritarian regimes. So, the, so just how much regimes are shaped by international powers is also going to change over time. 
So in the Cold War, very much so. And then I'm going to so take a take the stab of saying I think we've we've reached a moment where we can maybe divide the post stop saying post Cold War. Um, I think that that's something we're in a different era today than we were in the 1990s. Um, and so my stab at, at that is that what we had from end of the Cold War until around 2011 was not so much you know this kind of end of history or democracy on the march. What you really had was that almost all authoritarianism had to become electoral authoritarianism, almost everywhere. There, there's some exceptions, but basically the electoral principle became so dominant. So whereas during the Cold War, you had so many, you had many military regimes, you had many single military regimes that did not rely on elections. And so what you get after 1991, not so much democracies all over the place, you do get a lot more democracies, but mostly what you get is you get a lot of these electoral authoritarian regimes. So whereas during the Cold War, you know, Southeast Asia actually had an unusual number of electoral authoritarians. It then becomes much more so like in Malaysia, Singapore, Philippines, Indonesia. After the Cold War, during this, the post-91 period, it becomes more of the global standard, right? This rise in electoral authoritarianism. Um, but I think that in the past decade, something different is happening. I mean, basically what we had, it's a part of what went along with electoral authoritarianism was a lot of stolen elections and color revolutions. And what we saw, particularly with the color revolutions in former Soviet Union, was that you saw someone like Putin and some of the autocrats in the Middle East, especially after the Arab Spring, basically saw that something new had to, had to be done. And I think it's taken some time, but basically over the last decade, I think the forces of authoritarianism, again, if we go back to that disposition, the forces of anti-diversity, um, pro-tradition, uh, those forces have kind of regained their global foothold in the past decade. And so whereas for 20 years, that authoritarian impulse in politics had been weakened, uh, it's been greatly, greatly strengthened since around, i say around 2011 was a turning point. Um, and I think, so especially after the crackdowns on the Arab Spring and the global shockwaves. And so there's, I think, an on, I think there's an ongoing counter-revolution around the world right now that has been going on for over a decade. And so part of what this has meant that in this past decade, unlike others, we see an era of backsliding. So one way that authoritarianism is happening now that it didn't happen often before is because of democracy to actually backslide into authoritarianism. And so in many cases, it's these regimes that became kind of mere like barely electoral democracies, electoral regimes during the, the, the first post-Cold War era. But now we see them backsliding into you know, more like pretty much more closed authoritarian regimes um, today. So the idea would be, this is at least the first stat of thinking about when we study authoritarianism, we need to situate it in, in this period. Because all the, the kind of defining features of authoritarianism as a form of rule, I think mean, change across these different, these different eras. So that's kind of the, the idea, right? All right. So that's the first, so that the first entanglement I kind of want to talk about historically, not so much about talking through through literature, but the, but the second and third what I want to try to do the current approach I have is to actually do it by talking about literature and political science. That what we know what do we know about these historical entanglements? Okay, so whereas the previous section was more of a discourse in history, and global history, here I want to make the argument that we have we have got some some literature that explains why. We should expect these other historical entanglements to, to matter very much for how these regimes work. So there, in terms of historical sequences, which is the second entanglement, in, the, in particular, we see work that stresses the importance of the relative timing of these regimes development, um, these regimes formation, these are the economic development. So this idea that, um, you know, under conditions of late development, as opposed to early development. So after we get beyond Europe and think about how late development works, state-led development in Asia, Middle East, Africa, Latin America, pre pre prevents these, pre presents these very different uh, situations. And so we have work like Eva Bellin's work on <clears throat> Democrats that kind of argues that you know, under late development that both labor and capital, these classes that in the past have opposed authoritarianism, won't do so if they enjoy state sponsorship. So state-led development having this enormous impact on authoritarianism and support for it. Uh, David Rupert's Collier's work on shaping the political arena that looks at the timing of, you know, whether or not labor, labor incorporation and when that arises in the sequence of regime development. Um, Guillermo O'Donnell, much like Bellin, 
uh, who argued that under late development, actually there's a lot more support for authoritarianism than under early development, because again, the need to keep labor cheap for export reasons and for that rapid industrialization actually requires Donald Argus in Argentina and Brazil require the suppression of the masses. Um, and bureaucratic authoritarianism, of course, was seen as very uh, a useful model for thinking about Southeast Asian authoritarian regimes in the Cold War as well. Um, and then Benjamin Smith's excellent book on Indonesia and Iran that you might know, uh, which argues that so the reason that Iran had a revolution, but Indonesia survived, the Indonesian Basarto regime survived the, the big upsurge in 1978, was because although both were oil both were oil rich regimes, it mattered when the oil came available. Okay. And so whether or not and so in Indonesia he argues the authoritarian regime was built before the oil boom and in Iran it was built after the oil boom. Okay. And so the idea is that if you don't build the regime before the oil, it'll be a weaker regime. Okay. So again, these are matters of sequence, right? And so the idea is that, you know, as a matter of, you know, if you want to plug it into a, a quantitative analysis, Iran and Indonesia both had oil. Well, but one was stable and one wasn't. It's not that oil was irrelevant, but it mattered when. Not whether oil, but when oil. Okay. So historical sequence. So that historical sequencing is part of what made those regimes what they were, right? Not just, you know. So, so also I think there's there's a set of works that look at the relative time of conflict. So not just of, of economic development, so sort of like oil and, and labor corporation, but relative time of conflict. And I really like these works on, on early modern Europe by Darren and Ertman that look at uh, the military revolution. So again, whether, you know, what, what kind of, whether or not authoritarianism was, because they're all authoritarian regimes in early modern Europe, right? But whether or not there was a relatively, what was this, the, the power balance between the crown and the parliament? And that kind of where the, in, in situations where parliament had this authority, the, the question became how they generate revenue. And whether or not they had to respond to the costs of the military revolution by, by by increased taxation and having to sort of weaken parliaments. So you get these variation in how these different these early modern European regimes looked based on what they had before and after the, the military revolution. Uh, Thomas Ertman uh, similarly argues that when the when geopolitical competition became intense, the question was, did you already have literacy in place? If you already had literacy in place, then you could respond to the kind of the rise of, of you know, kind of, of cost of warfare with the bureaucracy. So you get all right, these kind of bureaucratic authoritarian regimes in parts of early modern Europe and in others, others you don't. But it depends on, again, the, the timing of the rise of warfare versus these other features of the regime. Um, Gregory Lubert's wonderful book on, um, on interwar Europe. Which is like if you don't basically argues that unless you developed some kind of liberal movement before World War One, it became impossible to develop one after World War One because you have the rise of mass politics, and at that point you're going to, everyone's either going to be a social democrat or a fascist, but, and so only in cases that only in those places that had liberalism before World War One were able to sustain democracy in, in a war period. And so this lack of, again, the, the lack of liberal development before this conflict, this pivotal, pivotal war uh, being of the essence. And then and then my first book, which argues that you know, stronger authoritarian regimes were built when they were preceded by these incredibly uh, disruptive and threatening forms of contentious politics, right? If they preceded the rise of the authoritarian regime, a stronger authoritarian regime was built. But if, if the conflict came after the regime was founded, then the regime was weakened by it and, and couldn't be strengthened out of like in the sense that Indonesia's was or Malaysia Singapore's was. So these are kind of a variety of ways in which I think we know, I think we should know. And I'm trying to bring together these lessons about it's not just your moment in world historical time, but also historical sequencing. Um, and then third, the third entanglement then on historical origins. So and I kind of divide these into two different kind of paradigms. Um, that in the most common one, I think, so again, this idea, I think a very common idea now that the origins of the regime, you know, explain it throughout its lifetime. And so this is what in one article I call the founding struggle paradigm. And it kind of starts with the same Huntington, who argued in, in 1968 that you know, authoritarian regimes that are built through these intense founding struggles will be much stronger regimes than those that arise without some kind of struggle, some kind of revolution, or some kind of, you know, some kind of war. Um, and we see that in a variety of other works. So Jason Brownlee looks at the contentious uh, resolution of factional conflicts uh, in places like uh, like Malaysia and, and Iran. 
um, Levitsky and Way, their brand new book, Revolution and Dictatorship, looking at the lasting effects of social revolutions on authoritarian durability, so places like China, Iran, Cuba, and then again, my book, Ordering Power. So besides the sequencing argument is the argument that um, it's, it's very much an argument about counter-revolutions. So the idea is that particularly intense founding counter-revolutions, like what we saw in Singapore, Indonesia, and Malaysia, gave rise to, to very different kinds of authoritarian regimes, more durable ones. And then a second approach to historical origins is what I'm calling the launching organization approach. So again, that a big part of how we understand authoritarian regimes is by looking at which political organization took the lead in founding it in the first place. And here I refer to Barbara Geddes's work, um, which is very quantitative work. It's not necessarily historical work, um, but it has this, it, it brings this historical sensibility in. Um, Geddes and her co-authors are you know, very focused on the idea that the best way to understand the nature of an authoritarian regime is by understanding um, which organization kind of found, found it and the characteristics of that organization. Um, and my former Chicago colleague, Michael Albertus, um, makes a similar point in his work on autocracy and distribution and with Victor Minaldo on, uh, on authoritarian constitutions. So again, that these, these launching organizations will often try to you know, put in a constitution very quickly to try to establish themselves as the preeminent organization. And then I have a, I have a brand new article with Luke and Way and uh, a couple other co-authors, um, um, John LaChapelle and Adam Casey, uh, in the journal Democracy, which just came out, um, on the origins of military supremacy and autocracies. Um, and so here, the, the basic idea is that the role of the military over time in an in a authoritarian regime will depend on whether or not the military uh, was, was created by the ruling party or whether the military had separate origins from the ruling party. And the idea is that unless the autocratic regime created the military, they're going to have a hard time controlling the military. Okay. So Indonesia and Burma are particularly interesting examples here where the militaries in post-independence Indonesia and Burma were created by the Japanese right, during the war. After the Japanese are defeated, essentially the masses of the military were removed. And so what you had in both Indonesia and Burma were these what we call masterless militaries. Okay. There was, unlike, say, China or Vietnam, where the military was 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 created by the ruling party, and so therefore the, the those those militaries still have their master in place, okay? and so there, we see lasting consequences for these authoritarian regimes as a result. Okay, so those are the the three historical entanglements, and then um, so I say in lieu of a conclusion, so just a, a few kind of parting thoughts uh, to wrap up with. So first, to kind of reiterate. So these purely static and strategic perspectives on authoritarianism. So it kind of only using kind of like a formal model or you know, again, removing all proper names and kind of dis, you know, um, dissociating authoritarian regimes from anything other than a strategic interaction between an autocrat and 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 opponents and allies. Um, these analyses tend to lack analytical depth. And not just, I mean, they, they obviously lack depth when you're talking about a specific regime. Like I think anybody would probably agree. If you want to understand a specific authoritarian regime, the history is important. But I want to say something a little bit beyond that, which is to say that even understanding the phenomenon of authoritarianism, right, is fundamentally has these historical entanglements. That's the claim I want to make. Now, secondly, I want to kind of move beyond this Cold War, post-Cold War, um, you know, distinction people make and give a fuller account of how authoritarianism has worked in different eras in world historical time, including, I think we need to start thinking about whether the, the quote-unquote post-Cold War era is over, um, which it is, um, and that if we start moving away from this residual definition of authoritarianism, try to think more actively about what it is and not just what it isn't, which is democracy, that this will be important for capturing all the ways, um, including ways that aren't captured here. I think it's all these ways that historical entanglements shape authoritarian regimes. So this is how, again, in kind of a vast volume on everything you can imagine about authoritarian regimes, that an essay on a chapter on Authoritarianism and historical perspective will hopefully, um, you know, kind of call attention to the way that we use history when studying authoritarianism. So, I'll end there for the next slide or conclusion slide, and that's that's all I have for now. So, thanks again for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, so much, Ben, for that uh, uh, I think I don't need to make any conclusion right now. I just will give an opportunity to all the audience here, both offline or online.
uh, if you have any question, Dan, do you want to answer one by one or we collect like the first session? Oh, we collect this for probably. Probably. Okay. So we will open the first session of this session with three questions. Uh, those who online, you could also ask the question using chat or you can raise your hand so we can notice that any question from the online. Or we, we could start with the offline audience first. Okay. I haven't really uh, confused my question and uh, feel me all this way, but um, I just um, I just have uh, this uh, reflection about uh, why authoritarian authoritarian governments uh, can be in place at first uh, from the first place. Um, then there are some. Uh, you also argue in one of your articles that uh, technology, the, the, the coming of technology also contribute to um, the context that uh, supporting authoritarian, authoritarian rule. Um, but looking deeper into many theories and many framework about that explaining why authoritarian, authoritarianism can be placed deep inside perhaps um, there is the factor of uh, growing fear in society about change or uncertainty in society. And um, yeah, and then again, I haven't really have a solid question about this, but um, maybe in, 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 the, in the world that we see today, um, how how already um can can that explain why um authoritarianism also gained popularity in our world today uh because there are some fear about uh you know that the new technology social media for example also climate change stuff like that yeah, yeah maybe Sorry, that's if good. it's not clear enough. No, that's but, very good. <laughs> thank you. I like that question very much. Next question, please. Abunhaks? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, Dan, for your interesting explanation on authoritarianism. Uh, you mentioned briefly about authoritarianism in Middle East. Can you explain more about authoritarianism in Middle East? What went wrong there? Because Experiment with democracy in Middle East in region always fail, including you know the Arab Spring. Is there any definition in terms of authoritarian authoritarianism in the Middle East? Is it destiny for the region, you know, uh, to experience authoritarianism over time? Is there any experiment that really successful in terms of? Implementing democracy in one area in the region, something like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. One more question. Okay, thank you. Thank you, then. Thanks. Okay, thank, thank you, then. So, uh, my question is based like this What do you think of the best approach to study uh, the re rise of authoritarianism in? Let's say democracy. So okay. this is my context. So you mentioned different approaches to study authoritarianism. Mm -hmm. But one thing that uh, I believe need more discussion is the the last uh, part, the backsliding there. It's like uh, when we study democracy, we don't see in the authoritarianism. But when we study authoritarianism, we don't see in the democracy. But now we have the era in which we have democracy, but now it's uh, goes back to authoritarianism. Yeah. So what do you think on the best way to approach it? Because I think the best way is we have to uh, to put into account both of these two things, mm -hmm. both democracy and uh, autocracy at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. Remember, we remember the debate about the negative case. There is no negative case actually, mm -hmm. either democracy or autocracy. But now we have two things together in 
in society and uh, to take into account also. What do you think? I remember the case of Indonesia, for example. Thank you. I can only double three balls at a time. That'll be hard enough. That's a very, very hard question. Um, so, uh, well, let me start with uh, I think that actually the fear question and uh, Zero's question, I think, are, are kind of, I, I think of them in similar ways. So, so, to me, fear, you know, I mean, my first book argued that fear is kind of the ultimate foundation of, of authoritarian stability. But ultimately, it's not a really durable authoritarian regime, isn't one where society fears the, the tyrant, it's where society fears each other. And therefore, they give power to the tyrant to, to keep them safe from their neighbors. You, if you fear your neighbor more than you fear the government, then you're you're prone to support an authoritarian regime, right? Um, and so I think that that's right. But I think that's also points toward this kind of the, the right wing authoritarianism, right? Um, not all authoritarianism is built on fear. Some authoritarianism is built on the idea that we need radical change. Liberal democracy is too um, indecisive and too slow, and uh, it doesn't give us what we need to be able to have this absolutely essential change. Um, and you know, it's urgent to use force if necessary to produce more equality in the world, or to produce more fairness. Um, or I think down the road we could very well see for for environmental um, change as well. You know, that I, I think it, it, we're not always surprised, and if we see. Um, you know, pushes for, for greater authoritarian control for the sake of environmental, like to basically prevent people from environmental and from activities damaging to, to the environment, right? So I think fear is a very, very, fear is the most important ingredient in one kind of authoritarianism, is the way I would think about it, but not all kinds of authoritarianism. Um, but I think it's, it's definitely a big part of it with the backsliding story. Um, I think that Basically, I think what has happened, you know, in over the last decade or so is the, the kind of anti-pluralist, the anti-pluralist coalition has kind of found its, its, its legs, it's found its strength. So during the Cold War, the, the political right, the counter-revolution had a very clear enemy, it had communism. Okay? And I think when communism ended, in a lot of ways, the, the, the real, the, the, the right wing, those who kind of want to draw on fear to try to uphold tradition and these, you know, and any kind of anything that protects us from the forces of change and diversity and wokeness now, like is, is worth, you know, is worthwhile. They, they kind of lost their way and basically they found it and their new enemy is, you know, is, it's not communism, but it's pluralism, right? It's diversity. Um, and, and the fear of that. And so I think a lot of what's happening with um, with backsliding is exactly that, because elections don't protect you from that. You know, le leaders who will manipulate fear and leaders who will um, galvanize voters on the basis of fear and appeal to fear, um, you know, as we've seen, can be very, very successful. And I think that's a big part of what's happening with, with backsliding. But to, to, for the, but to the more conceptual part of the question, Sarah, I would say, that's why I want to see us relax this residual definition, because if if authoritarianism is nothing more than the absence of democracy, it's hard to think about how they combine, right? Um, because something doesn't combine with its opposite. But if if we go back to my the definition that Sophia Fenner and I put forward, which is not perfect, and I'm not pushing for it as a specific definition, but just as one example, if the essence of authoritarianism is that it's like it bridles your opponents in opposition. Right, that it, you know, I mean, that elected leaders can do that. Like elected leaders, freely and fairly elected leaders can attack their opponents and weaken their opponents and weaken civil society. We've seen this all, like so many of the cases around the world are exactly that. Someone like Duterte, someone like Modi, right? Someone like Erdogan, okay? Someone like Orban, someone like Trump, right? They win elections and then they use their power to attack, to attack their opponents, right? That's how, if we think of authoritarianism, not as just like, oh, something that's missing, but something that is very authoritarian, very authoritarian leaders can be really fairly elected. And that's, I think, the kind of terrifying lesson of the past decade. And that's, and nobody is free from that. No one is, you know, that's, America is not safe because it's quote unquote consolidated. You know, France is not safe because it's quote unquote consolidated. Britain is not safe. No place is totally safe, right? Any place could have this happen. 
Um, that's, I think, the, the big lesson of the past decade. And that's new. That's why I think we're in a different part of the world historical time, right? Because now this backsliding means the specter of authoritarianism exists everywhere in a way that it didn't before the past decade. That I think is really new. Um, and then, so to the Middle East, you know, it's you, you supposedly the one, you know, the one supposed democracy in the Middle East, Israel, now I think is also falling into the same category, right? Um, hundreds of thousands of, of Israelis protesting to say we, we've stopped being a democracy. So there too. Um, I don't know if there's any just one magical explanation about the about the Middle East. I do think that uh, you know that certainly Turkey and Lebanon, um, you've seen you know bouts of substantial you know, democratic governance in the in the Middle East at, at times. Um, I think the kind of question is why it hasn't taken footing. Um, and I think that you know people would tend to, to focus on in some places this oil, um, in some places it's um, you know American aid and uh, just the kind of overgrown uh, coercive apparatus in a place like a place like Egypt. Um, these sorts of stories. I don't know if there's just one story, but I do think you know for reasons that we, we don't entirely understand. Um, I think re their regional effects are strong, and diffusion within a region within a region is strong. Um, and it might be just because of the way that people think about who their analogous countries are. You know, um, it might just be that you know democracy requires a certain regional momentum. Um, but you know, I think that you can think of the Middle East a little bit like the, the the Metternich era that I was talking about, right? So, in much the same way that the uh, that the Napoleonic Wars in, uh, in 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 Europe led to this alliance of you know, of monarchs, you know, again the threat of republicanism. I think in a lot of ways the uh, the Iranian Revolution did the same thing, you know, and that it, it sent this sort of shockwave through much of the Islamic world, which then and then sees Iran as this threat in a lot of, in a similar way to the these these Metternich style monarchs in in nineteenth century Europe saw saw Napoleon you know and saw this the Napoleonic regime right and one more I guess I have one more kind of pet theory about the Middle East right which is the puzzle in the Middle East is not just why there's so much authoritarianism but why do we have these durably authoritarian monarchs okay. here's the, the funny about the Arab Spring was it was only in the republics. Where you saw these, you know, we saw really serious challenges. Right? Bahrain, partial exception. But basically, the monarchies were very stable. And okay? it's very interesting. Like, why would monarchies? And so, so some political scientists, again, without a lot of historical perspective, say, well, monarchy is just more durable, right? But if you if you stop for one second and think, right? No, like every republic is a former monarchy. It's a monarchy that collapsed. So monarchy is not more durable than. But there's something about these monarchies that. Makes them durable, and my my sort of pet theory for that is is as follows: that during the Cold War, again, world historical time matters. During the Cold War, the opposition to Arab monarchies came from socialists, Baathists, right? And Arab monarchs had no real answer to to, to the challenge of socialism because they're completely alien, completely different, right? So if a military officer is, is inspired by the Muslim Brotherhood or inspired by the Ba'ath Party and they want to overthrow the monarchy, the monarchy has no real defense, right? But in the post-Cold War period, once socialism goes away, what's the primary, we think is the primary threat to Arab monarchs from what ideology? It comes from Islamists, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Monarchs know how to deal with that because in a place like Morocco, or in Jordan, right? Monarchs can be, they, they're, they're the fathers of Islam. They're the fathers of religion. They're the, lead, they're the religious leaders. So I think one reason these monarchies in the Arab world are so durable right now, only now, but weren't before, is because now the opposition they face is something they know how, they know how to absorb. They know how to deal with it. They, can, they know how to deal with an Islamist opposition in a way that they didn't know how to deal with Baathist, socialist, Arab, pan-Arab nationalist opposition. So it's not that monarchy is different. It's that it's in, 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 as a matter of world historical time, what's the dom what's the main ideology that would oppose these these monarchies? Okay. So I think I don't think there's one sort of that whole region, but I think there's if you piece these things all together, you're like, okay, well, at this point, you're seeing a lot of strikes against democracy emerging in the in, in the Middle East. 
now I will I open the presentation. Yeah, I saw. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you very much um, for your to listen to your presentations. Um, just quick. Oh, yes, um, uh, just quick. Um, my, my simple question is uh, what factors um, shape the timelines that you provided. Uh, I was wondering, um, do you relate to the, the work uh, published by uh, Levitsky and Zipka, um, highlighting um, the history events that reveals how the authoritarianisms uh, uh, flourish in Latin America and Europe? Mm -hmm. So you start from there, or you have you have any any further uh, differences? Because uh, uh, as uh, Levitsky and Zipka said, that democracy is democracy die from within, let's say from the strongman, or let's say from the ballot box. Yeah. So uh, with the rise of uh, far right parties to populism, like in, in Europe or in the US, even Christians nationalism or what why Christian nationalism in the US. So do they refer from things that uh, that uh, that shape how the patterns of authoritarianism. Thank you very much. Others? Thank you. Uh, this is interesting to understand authoritarianism from historical perspective. One thing that I need more information is from uh, the actors, as you mentioned earlier. Um, during and till the 80s, most of uh, authoritarian regime, the actors, the main actors are military, it's like in Latin America. And in different uh, historical time, the actors may be party or individual. So from from, from this uh, perspective from actor, how does it fit to your historical uh, this entanglement, especially in sequence one? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Amy? Uh, Julia, I was wondering about, and like, uh, about the historical agents in your concept of triple entanglement. Because you know, sometimes, uh, story like by the historical agents very powerful sometimes uh, yeah but in your purpose uh, I, I was wondering about how we actually how do we elaborate our position in actors in your concept thank you it makes it a little bit easier if two people are not in the same thing so that's that helps a little bit i actually think all, all three of you are Kind of on the same the same tree and the same sort of sort of idea you know so this question of what role actors play and then the, the kind of how democracies die and literature so what 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 this game Ziblatt are kind of arguing in their in their very very successful and really wonderful book is that you know you know the democracy died through norm erosion okay so that democracy you know it's it's why so why is it suddenly so fragile well it's always been fragile but but it rests on certain norms you know, and then once leaders stop following those norms, like showing forbearance, like not using literally every power at your disposal against your opponents, you show some kind of, you know, forbearance against, because you don't want them to retaliate, you know, just some kind of mutual restraint. And then that's kind of the guard, the soft guardrail, if you will. So once those guardrails are gone, there's nothing really, you know, nothing really left. Um, I think that's, I think that's right. I think it's a little bit like, you know, I mean, you look like wait, what's cause of death, right? Is it cause of death? Like, well, you know, you, the person, the patient stopped breathing, right? Um, like it's getting a little bit too close to the to the outcome. Like once you see these leaders doing that, it's already, you know, that's kind of the last straw. But I guess I would just focus more on how you get there. 
And so we, what are the patterns of this, this long string of leaders who are all eroding norms, right? And again, I think I would point more to the ways in which there's this, re, this rebirth of a global reactionary, counter-revolutionary, pro-tradition, nativistic, anti-liberal, anti-progressive, anti-woke, anti-whatever alliance all over the place, which I think is kind of on the march and on the attack and on the offensive at this point, right? And that's, it's because they have a coalition of voters behind them who they now manage to mobilize all over again. And they can, in some places, at least win elections. Most places they lose. Right. Usually the progressive alliance and coalition is enough to defeat it, but not everywhere. Um, and so when that happens, that's when you see these norms erode. So I think it's, it's kind of, it's sort of like, you know, it's, uh, I don't know what the right analogy is, but it's sort of like, it's, it's what, it, it's the actual eventual cause of death, but not the disease that leads to that, you know, something like that. Um, and then in terms of actors and how do we fit actors into history here, I guess, you know, you could, I guess about two minds. You could, I mean, why on earth? Like, what's different about these time periods? You know, like what makes them different? Um, and one thing that makes them different is like, what's the what's the ideology of the time? How how does how are ideologies shifting over time? Um, another is that you know these breakpoints are often caused by like by war, you know, or other kinds of like major major technological shifts that bring you to these new eras. Um, and those, I think, are quite important. Um, and I, I would put, I guess, more stress on those things than the actors per se. So again, if we take the example of the kind of, you know, monarchies trying to survive in a Cold War versus monarchies trying to survive after the Cold War, the monarchies are still the same, the actors are still the same, but they're just in a different ideological universe. You know, they're just in a different, you know, and that's that's not kind of reducible to, to the actors per se. Um, but I, but I do think you could, you could certainly at each stage in the process sort of say, how do the actors shift? Um, it's definitely the case that, um, you know, I focus on the fact that electoral authoritarianism becomes more important after the Cold War. But as I said, that's because you get this elimination of the single party and the military regimes, right? That's a structural change, but also it has implications for who the, who the actors are. So the, so the, so the, 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 the malicious actors of the post Cold War period are mostly not, mostly, some places it's still military leaders. Um, some places it's still single party leaders. There's still some, um, but mostly it's elected politicians. Like predominantly now, it's these politicians who are able to tap into fear, back to the first question, right? tap into this fear and give voice to it and learn from each other. and. Uh, it really make people afraid of uh, of social change and afraid that they're losing their you know that they're losing their privileges and losing their uh, you know losing their position you know in this push toward more uh, more diversity you know that they they no longer recognize the world they live in and they want to they want to switch the clock back and, and fight back against those who are making the world unrecognizable to them right? so these are actors so I guess that maybe yeah, I, th I think what I would like to do in, in response to that question is, yeah, at each of these, at each of these world historical moments, I should be clear about who I see the, the main actors being. And is that something that changes as these eras change? Because that's not what I'm thinking of mostly is what changes, but do they change? And if so, I should kind of make, be very clear about that. It's, a, it's, it's always good to get me thinking, not just in structure, but in thinking in terms of, of actors. That's, that, that's good for I, I need that slap every once in a while. <laughs> Not that you were slapping me, but it's, I, I feel like a slap in a good way. Like, wait, no, come on, there's more than just slapping. So, so, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I must confess that I, I do not appreciate to understand what you're saying. Uh, I can check that. I noticed that. Uh, you explain all the authoritarian within a nation state. Is that right? It varies, but go ahead. Well, um, I also noticed that it is necessary to be uh, authoritarian uh, in, the, in the occupied territory or in the in the negara uh, jajahan, but, but not necessarily the occupier. Authoritarian. You mentioned about Israel. Uh, 
it is necessary for, for, for Israel to be authoritarian in the West Bank, in the uh, uh, East Jerusalem, or in the Gaza, but Israel not necessarily authoritarian. Do you think it's there is uh, it could be uh, you know a make differentiation between those situations during occupying or during a colonialism and uh, during in nation state, which is I mean uh, colonialism is not a uh, nation state or occupying like Palestine is not a uh, nation state. Thank you. Can I go ahead and yes. answer this one right away? Like, I think um, it was a really, really good question. Um, if you put back up the, uh, if, we, if we put back up that slide, which is a different world historical time, another thing that really varies is the role of external actors, like within um, within authoritarian rule. And you know, as I was saying about that 1848 to 1914 period, age of imperialism, right? And actually, one of my main research interests right now is going to the archives and unearthing the way authoritarian rule worked in the colonies. You know, because the British Empire is a set, it's one empire, but if you go look at a place like Malaya or a place like Jamaica or a place like Ceylon, um, what you see is an authoritarian regime in place, right? Because by definition, occupation is authoritarian arrangement. Absolutely. Unless you have national sovereignty, you do not have democracy, right? Um, but to what degree is there active repression? To what degree is the, you know, you know, and I think certainly the, the case of occupation in the, in the West Bank and Gaza is a, is a very, very clear example of that, without question. So, um, as I mentioned during, during the Cold War, I think what you saw, the authoritarian regimes we saw around the world were more externally propped up and more externally defined than in the period that followed, right? So I think that I wouldn't answer the question of like how much these are just nation states versus part of a, a more international um, dynamic. Um, I wouldn't answer that in the abstract. I would answer it with just looking empirically at different points in time. And there are times when it matters more and times when it matters less. But yes, I should be absolutely clear that I, I would agree with you and completely insist that conditions of foreign occupation are absolutely the kind of cases that I'm interested in and that I would want to look like. And I am doing a lot more of my research effort into nowadays. Um, that I'd love some time to come talk about the research I'm doing on that. It's certainly, it's, that's very, very uncooked. Um, but uh, it, it's a very, it's again, as with the actors, these are things that I should try to um, make, it, make explicit. And I also don't know what I'm saying. So we 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 stood you entirely. You mentioned that query authoritarianism can be like uh calm and others. And also uh, I think uh as the equation. Yeah. Does a democratic country also at the same time an authoritarian country? I mean, like you know, Indonesia uh, since the beginning already uh, proclaimed as a democratic country, democracy Pancasila for some. And now, yeah, we some of us also uh, disappointed about democracy in Indonesia. And yeah, that's why probably uh, the the term of authoritarianism or uh, democracy span of the uh, uh, claim or the claim for yeah to make uh, yeah that that you are a democratic country and you are uh, uh, author an authoritarian country. Right. It's yeah. So to what uh, uh, how we classify the um, the real democratic or the real authoritarian. Thank you. Uh, so interesting to see this uh, discussion and so inspiring. Uh, how do you analyze the 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 and okay? I saw that was because of <laughs> sorry, sorry, okay. Um, my question is uh, about 
uh, it is my uh, view thing that we have to integrate between the like authoritarian values and the democratic system. System. It's like my my assumption that yeah, we, this is like we have to integrate because we see the the what the data from the democratic system. And then, and uh, when I see your definition definition about the relaxed authoritarian is what maybe we have to integrate. What do you think about that? And if we do the integration, what kind of the values that we can put the authoritarian values that we can put in the Saudi political system? Okay, thank you. Can you say what you mean by by integrate a little bit more? Like yeah. what do you mean by like uh, yeah like we said like we are, we are in a democratic country, but actually we are not too democratic. So what kind of the authoritarian values that we can apply in the yeah democratic system? Thank you. One person one question. One person one question. Thank you, uh, we, uh, Terima kasih, uh, Professor Slater, for your interesting topics. And uh, it's really kind of uh, interesting for me because uh, you have relaxed definition uh, about uh, relaxed. Yeah, relaxed definition. Relaxed I mean, uh, understanding about uh, authoritarianism because uh, from number one, I think four, I have. Uh, I have such as uh, so, um, um, uh, maybe several questions because I see uh, with number two uh, there there is some mass politics and electoral principle uh, in in Indonesia. I was wondering uh, related to Bu uh, Iba also also Masiro if we have uh, seen uh, what like a democratic era now in Indonesia. It's just. I don't know, but I wonder it's backsliding because we do not have any value or whole value of democracy. I see uh, maybe in Indonesia there are some uh, political dynasty like Ibu Atut, Hoshia, and so on. So I see that uh, the principle of literal is just um, maybe we have to realize that we have to we have analyze more and also. Um, or, or number four shifts in the technological frontier. I was wondering, oh, we we often hear about artificial intelligence right now. So there are several countries uh, has this, um, uh, I, I think uh, concerning issues about artificial intelligence. Because if we see uh, in China, they, ha they have uh, robots, military robots, uh, if we talk about artificial intelligence. But right now, I see that uh, not only artificial intelligence, but we have super in artificial intelligence right now. Uh, yeah, Indonesia just concerned about uh, AI or artificial intelligence, but I see in other countries we have uh, many, many like uh, upcoming or uh, yeah, upcoming uh, issues about this. Uh, in in terms of authoritarianism. What do you see about the shifts in the in the, in the, in the technological frontier? I mean, um, is that um, maybe perhaps I see in the military operation? Uh, is that also related to the implementation uh, of actors? If you see actors to implement the policy, is that related or showing the, that the authoritarianism really can be seen even in democratic country? Such as uh, yeah, Indonesia also, or uh, because we talk about the implementation policy of policy implementations. Maybe that's all, Professor. Thank you so much. You wanna respond now or yeah. okay? What the other this? Oh, so just they, I mean, you yeah, just have to like just one more. Oh, one more. And then so it's like hey, and then you know. Okay. 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 Um. I just think that uh, sometimes we take it for granted that authoritarian uh, is a threat, is a negative yeah. style of leadership. But uh, if you look into history, um, there was time that authoritarianism is considered as better than democracy, that democracy is even the more, you know, um, exposing us to uh, risk and uncertainty. Uh, Immanuel Kant, I thought, oh, they don't really approve with democracy. 
And how would you project, you know, the uh, the possibility that probably one day we will wake up into the world where we dislike democracy and we love authoritarianism. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, I, I have quite similar questions. You mentioned about monarchy is more durable, but based on your explanation, it seems, it seems that authoritarianism also do very durable, even though it's some form into different, it depends on the historical context, but actually it's there. And it seems also that when we, we talk about authoritarianism, uh, it's always related to negative things. But you also mentioned here uh, before that there is right and left wing authoritarianism. So since it will be there all over the time in different time sequence and time periods, under what condition could authoritarianism uh, benefit to the society? Is it possible? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> okay. Democratic authoritarian government. Okay, okay. <laughs> Let me try. Um, so, so I think this kind of starts. So, so what are, are democracy and authoritarian new opposites, right? Or mutually exclusive? And I think again, only with a residual definition are they are they opposites. And I think I, I'd, I'd actually like to do a little more historical research on this, like just the term and how we talk about it. I suspect the main reason we think of, you know, regimes are democratic or authoritarian or one or the other, and, you know, we're, you say we're democratic, you're authoritarian, is basically a function of the Cold War. And that during the Cold War, the, the whole US versus Soviet, you know, rivalry kind of led to this, you know, and then what you got from that was a whole, you know, I mean, industry, if you will, um, you know, like, think tanks and you know kind of their job is to, to sort of say like call out you know governments for being repressive and being authoritarian and, and this kind of thing um and i think what we've seen in recent years is that the, they can you know they can go together pretty well um and that you know again democratically procedurally democratically elected governments can do all kinds of things that would make actions that we think of as, as authoritarian actions right sort of you know like repression anti-pluralistic you know kind of action so thinking about this is i think a big theme a lot of these questions you know on sarah too um how these how these things go together um i guess you know one thing we haven't really talked about and what i would sort of try to shift our attention to, to here is uh is the state and, if democracy and authoritarianism are, if nothing else, they're, they're, they're regime types, right? There's something about how you access state power, right? And to some degree, what you can do with, with, with state power. But I really do feel like almost every outcome we care about, like in terms of things that we, that we want, in terms of like what's, what's beneficial, whatever, is really the product of, of, of state action, state capability. And that, you know, if, if you give me a choice and you have democracy, authoritarianism, you can have you know, an effective bureaucratic state that can actually achieve things versus the total lack of one. Um, your, your life is probably a lot more different depending on what the state is like. And I think that when, if an authoritarian regime seems to be really good at, having, at doing something, I think generally the credit doesn't go to authoritarianism, the credit goes to, to the state. The fact that they actually had a, you know, a state apparatus that could achieve this thing that the authoritarian regime achieved. And to be logically consistent, I would say the same thing with democracy, right? I think that you know democracy really, really fails to deliver you know good good things also when there's a lack of a of a functioning state that can actually you know put into place the things that people that people want. Um, now I think that an intrinsic advantage of democracy over authoritarianism is that it's just that you're safer from state repression, right? You 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 might still be very, very vulnerable to, you know, to corruption, you might be very vulnerable to um, violence coming from society. But again, that's, again, that's not so much about, about the regime type, it's about, about the state. So I think there's been way too much, I think, effort by people to change in defense of democracy. Well, democracy will give you all these good things. All democracy gives you is democracy, right? That's it. You know, it doesn't give you anything other than 
<laughs> it doesn't it doesn't give you it doesn't give you health care it doesn't give you you know you know you know labor rights and you know, those things might come through democracy but they can also those get, things get granted by authoritarian regimes sometimes too you know so i think you either you either if you the, the, the most important defense of democracy is intrinsic right just that you know, do you, do you want to live in you know in fear that the state could do whatever it wants to you, whatever it wants, and you can disappear, and there's nothing anybody can do about it. You know that you do you want to know that you can say whatever you want to say um, in a room like this, and not worry about being you know being brought in for you know for, for tea with the you know with the you know with the police about what you what you talk about, right? Do we value those things or do we not value those things? Right? I mean the and, and just the, the ability of people who want to take a different perspective and think differently and speak differently about the world and, and raise their voice, that their ability to do so, I think, is, you know, is the thing that I would kind of focus on. You know? And in very interesting ways, that all the procedures that come with democracy might not give us very good protection of that, you know, because people who get elected might, you know, might be really unwilling or, or disinterested in protecting those things. And people might, you know, people might mostly really just value those rights for themselves. You know, that, you know, governments that are bullying and repressive, you might think they become unpopular, but if they're bullying people who are unlike you, they're very popular. You want to answer this one? No? <laughs> <laughs> not, not enough? <laughs> I thought you missed Oh, no, no, there was poison pipes. I tried to finish before I sleep. <laughs> Any other questions, comment? Uh, Dan, when you mentioned about historical sequence, you mentioned two types of uh, relative timing of development and conflicts. Right. Uh, based on the literature, is there any case of authoritarian regime in, this, in any countries that, ha that happened due to the combination of these two? timing of development and conflict at the, at the same time. And also, is there any other critical juncture other than development and time of conflicts that lead to the survival of authoritarian regimes? Uh, that's, that's a good question. And, and so the fact that I've lumped all this different work on sequence together under development and conflict, I think captures most of it um but uh i'm not claiming i would just say nothing that i'm claiming here do i say is exhaustive so there might be other ways that authoritarianism and, and history are entangled that i haven't talked about it might be that there are other sequences that that matter those are the ones that jump out to me from the literature but there's nothing in here that is like logically exhaustive you know, it's hopefully providing a bunch of ways in which um, authoritarianism and history are uh, entangled in ways that we can't really do justice to what authoritarianism is without paying attention to those historical entanglements. But hopefully this will be an invitation to others to think about more ways in which that in which that's true. Um, and to think about you know in democracy as well. You know, the, you know, again, any any you know. The more the more history we're doing, the, the richer the historical side of our research and our understanding of the world is. I think the, the the stronger it always is. And one reason why I think is because historical appreciation and um, understanding, I think, is is a good defense against the most naive forms of uh, cultural analysis, where we sort of say, well, people like this are deficient in some way. Like people A are like this, and people B are like this, and that's just how they are, and they're there's some cultural deficiency they have. I mean, everything that we that people call these cultural differences always can be made sense of through attention to history. Like there are reasons why people behave differently. There are reasons why people think differently. There are reasons why people fear different things. And hopefully we can all be a little bit more tolerant when we see everyone coming from a historical background, which makes their prejudices and their, you know, their their opinions and their values and whatever make make more sense. No question, no comment. Ali. Silly. Yeah. Silly I, I promise a silly answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I would like to ask you about your work historical time. Yeah, Here you uh, from 1991 to 2011, yeah. you classified it as electoral authoritarian. Yeah. Uh, in my opinion, lots of uh, leaders from us uh, also are authoritarian. And they were elected in the play. For example, in Indonesia, President Suharto was always elected to the But President Suharto manipulates the elections. So, why you uh, put the years from 1991 to 2000? Thank you. Not, not that question at all. Um, the uh, so electoral authoritarianism was quite rare during the, during the Cold War. Um, it was not a very common regime form, and so um, someone like so Lewinsky and Way's 2010 book, um, which they call competitive authoritarianism, basically argues that it's a post, it's overwhelmingly a post Cold War phenomenon. And uh, if you read, uh, or, and that's a wonderful book. There's also there's a, another wonderful book by uh, Andrea Shetler called uh, The Politics of Uncertainty, um, which in 2013. And it's, it's all about old, kind of electoral authoritarianism. And it's, at some point, it's really kind of striking. It says you know, that before the Cold War, there were, I think, he, he says, based on his very careful data collection, there were six electoral authoritarian regimes that were, during the, that were before the end of the Cold War, only six. Um, and everything else is like a single party regime or a military regime, right? Only six. And what's so striking about it to me, and something I, I want to write about for some time, is four of those six are in Southeast Asia. Right? So you get four of the six during the like so during the Cold War period. So if I recall correctly, the six, so the two that are not, I think, were Mexico and, uh, and Paraguay, I believe. He refers to as, as electoral authoritarian before the end of the Cold War. And then within Southeast Asia, uh, Indonesia. Malaysia, uh, Philippines, and Singapore. That and so it's, it is interesting. I think that if, if, if this region, so the, the idea, so I was found it a little bit odd, I guess. You know, so I think like you, I, I thought it was a little bit silly, right? When people were saying, well, all of a sudden there's this new thing called electoral authoritarianism. I was like, boy, I've been looking at that for <laughs> as long as I've been looking at authoritarianism. Um, but it, it is striking. You go to like basically sub-Saharan Africa was across the board, either military rule or or single party rule. Um, you know, or, or, or your monarchies, places too, right? The, and, you know, so that was the that was kind of how it, how it looked. Or these kind of personalistic, you know, dictators that you know, weren't someone like Gaddafi, right? Not not ruling through elections, not no serious electoral exercise. So, so the end of the Cold War did put all this pressure on countries around the world to hold more meaningful competitive elections, or at least a multi party election. That was the real that was the real change, and so. You know, in real time, someone like Fukuyama said, okay, well, now we have democracies everywhere, right? So if I look at Russia, Russia's a democracy now. Well, no, Russia was having multi party elections, but never quite like established, you know, democracy. So this is the thing with, with temporality. So it's almost everything that I'm talking about in that sort of define one of these world historical eras also exists in other eras. Right? They're not. They're not bookended by the beginning and the end, but it's just kind of the predominant, it's the main difference about what, what makes that time period distinctive, right? Um, and so that's kind of what I'm sort of going for. And, you know, again, I think it's better than nothing. So hopefully if uh, it'll be at least a little bit, you know, something to get us to talk about, think about beyond, beyond that. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then are you still happy to receive a question? Oh, we we'll choose some now. <laughs> I think that's me. Uh, well, Brown mentions Maka, so if, <laughs> if, if, if there's Maka, I don't want to yes. steal from from Maka. Right? <laughs> so, uh, so oh. you would like to please oh. 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 and then thank you very much. <laughs>
Israel open the Michi to us to translate the directly. Or I want to give a last chance for the online participants okay. if you have any questions. If you don't, I will we will stop now. Uh, if you have a question, just raise your hand. I mean, using the icon and the Zoom. At the beginning, I put my email address up. So okay, I, I don't. I'm not going to die or anything. You can, yeah, you, you have. The, you can ask me questions directly even after the session. Yeah, okay. So if you have questions, oh, sure. feel free yeah. to uh, Okay, since no question, it seems no question from online too. Uh, based on some request from participants here, so I would like to end this uh, discussion with a big thank you to Dan Slater for coming to this meeting. Uh, thank you so much. Terima kasih banyak teman-teman semua. Silakan yang mau Thank you so much. Thank you so much.